Hello, I'm Michael Brown, President of the School for Advanced Research in Santa Fe, New Mexico. It's my great pleasure to welcome you to our fifth Creative Thought Forum event, part of our 2022 series, Seeking Justice Toward a More Equitable America. Today's event is entitled The Crisis of Truth in Democratic Societies. Observers of democratic life in the United States and elsewhere have concluded that appeals to untruths or half-truths have become far more common in political life than in the past. This webinar considers whether the alleged crisis of truth represents a danger to democracy, and if so, what can be done about it. Several experts will consider the factors driving this phenomenon and approaches that might counter it. They are Drake Bennett, who will moderate today's discussion, and presenters Sophia Rosenfeld and Rebecca Salmet. Before I do a handoff to Drake, um, I want to mention that we are grateful to the following Creative Thought Forum series sponsor for their support. First, the National Endowment for the Humanities, which asks us to state that any views, findings, conclusions, or recommendations expressed in this event do not necessarily represent those of the National Endowment for the Humanities. Uh, another important sponsor is Patricia Foshi for the Stuart Hall Charitable Fund, the Paulo Hema Foundation, Thornburg Investment Management, the Luke and Betty Vortman uh, Endowment Fund, the Flora Crichton Lecture Fund, and members of SAR's Founder Society. Events like these are possible, made possible through the generous support of our donors and members. If you'd like more information about becoming an SAR member, please visit our website sarweb.org. We also appreciate your voluntary donations for this event. The moderator today, as I mentioned, is Drake Bennett. Drake's a feature writer for Bloomberg Businessweek, where he's written about ransomware, hacking, genealogy-based murder investigations, a cruise ship, COVID outbreak, and the hunt for cobalt. So you can tell he's a very uh, diverse and talented journalist. His work has also appeared in the New York Times Magazine, Wired, and other publications, and has been collected in the best American science and nature writing and the best business writing. So now I'll uh, hand the uh, controls over to Drake Bennett, who will introduce our two other presenters. Thank you, Drake. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, SAR. Um, so I think the importance of the topic we're going to be talking about today um, doesn't really need much explaining. Um, and uh, I'm really excited about this conversation um, because we have two uh, writers and thinkers uh, who are, I think, uniquely well-equipped to help us unpack some of the issues around it. Uh, and in ways that um, I think will be interestingly complementary. Um, so I'm gonna get out of the way and just introduce them. Um, so the, the, the first uh, is Sophia Rosenfeld, who is a professor of history at the University of Pennsylvania. Um, she teaches European intellectual history with a special focus on the enlightenment and the age of revolutions. Um, among her many interests are the history of the emotions and the senses, the history of free speech, dissent and censorship, the history of political language, the history of epistemology, and the history of information and misinformation. Um, and her most recent book, I think, is particularly relevant to our conversation today. Uh, the title is Democracy and Truth, A Short History. Uh, so I'm going to go out on a limb and say that I uh, think Professor Rosenfeld uh, thinks that there is a history to what we're going to talk about today. Uh, and I was hoping she could kick things off by talking a bit about it. Well, OK, great. I'd be happy to. Thank you for that introduction. And um, I think I'll start out a little more generally, but I promise I'll get there, Drake. So I think there's a good reason that so many of us are talking rather nervously these days about the future of democracy. It's pretty hard not to wonder in some ways if the era of democracy that we know is coming to an end. And people are asking, you know, are we sliding into an era of cold or even hot civil war or a kind of authoritarianism with democratic features? Or maybe is this just the new normal? And it may be too soon to know, but I think we can all identify certain warning signs. Increased polarization in the electorate, dysfunction in representative institutions like Congress, sporadic outbreaks of political violence, targeting of minority populations, and our particular focus today, the circulation of more dis and misinformation more effectively than anyone can remember 
but what, but what also seems to be maybe an assault on the very value of truth. And importantly, this isn't just happening in the US, it's happening in a lot of the world's major democracies from India to Brazil to parts of Europe. And it's happening from on high, you know, coming from government leaders and party heads and from below the social media feeds of ordinary people. And so I think as Drake just suggested, in some ways our big question is now kind of what, what can be done? But speaking as a historian, I do think we have a sort of first question before we get to what can be done. And that is, how did we get here? What do democracies historically need to function effectively? And why are they experiencing so much trouble now? And my answer starts with a reminder of something that I think it's pretty easy to forget today since we're pretty used to the government that we live under, that democracy from antiquity to sometime in the 20th century has been pretty consistently considered one of the most challenging or difficult forms of government to make workable, especially in large and economically and culturally diverse places. And that's because in part, to function, it depends not only on coercion, forcing people to do what they're supposed to, but it depends on citizen sharing, almost as if by magic, some largely or unspoken or maybe we could say tacit commitments. And what I'd like to do in my brief remarks today is really point to three of those tacit commitments, all of which I think are under particular stress at the moment. One, the one we've spent the most, I've spent the most time talking about and the one that's our focus today is a shared conviction about truth. The idea very basically that truth exists, that most people are telling it most of the time, that we know how to find it more or less, and that certain basic consensual demonstrable truths, truths say about what causes what or what's dangerous or what's generally desirable or even how to categorize what's happened are the foundation on which laws and policies depend. And this idea really goes all the way back to the 18th century, the era of the enlightenment and the age of revolutions when the very first advocates for republics as democracies were then known claimed that what really differentiated republics from monarchies is that monarchies depended on deception and cunning and secrecy, whereas republics would distinguish themselves for prizing the opposite, concrete evidence, transparency, personal sincerity, and that all of this could be sort of naturally achieved with nothing more than a protection for freedom of speech. Now, obviously in practice, that's been close to impossible to maintain. In part, that's because there's some catches about how truth works in a democracy. First, there's no one source of truth. There's no one person or caste or institution or method that gets definitively to say what's what, meaning truth's always gonna be contested. And moreover, the two main groups of people who are supposed to work collectively and continually to establish some basic truths in public life experts on the one hand and ordinary people on the other are often at odds with one group trying to shut out the claims of the other or their ways of knowing. So truth in democracy is a never a stable thing, but especially in recent years, as experts have moved increasingly towards technocracy or kind of rule by experts alone, and as large segments of the general population have moved increasingly with the help of demagogic leaders, I might add, towards a kind of populism or rule of the people in defiance of what corrupted experts have to say, we've seen something, a pronounced development, I would say, a kind of increasing tribalism where even what counts as factual truth and how and where you can find it have become politicized. So what's happened recently? I think the process has been exacerbated everywhere by social media, which drives both sensationalism and polarization and maybe we in some ways we may wanna talk about, as well as the legal frameworks around them. It's also though been driven by popular anger at the ways globalization and the spread of democracy and capitalism have not delivered to many people, despite promises to the contrary, despite enfranchisement in the name of the rule of the people. People often see just loss, not gain. And I think it's been driven very recently by a kind of nihilism in face of the problems that we see today, problems that are so huge and intractable, climate change or refugee crisis around the globe, pandemics, war, that business as usual seems rather irrelevant. 
And if I was thinking of one thing that sort of encapsulated all of this, I might point to the big lie of the stolen presidential election, now believed or at least espoused by a substantial number of American voters, despite all evidence to the contrary. In some ways, the big lie is exhibit A for this turn in our political culture. But the big lie should also remind us, I think, of two other shared and often unacknowledged commitments that democracies have long required. And these factors are also severely challenged today. So if one sort of underlying tacit point that people need to share is a conviction that truth matters in some form, a second is a commitment to rules or procedure which is to say a kind of agreement about how the game of politics will be played, whether we like the opposition or not. And of course, the big lies also showed us in some ways the tension on the idea that at least we all share what the rules should look like. And finally, a third key commitment that democracy is traditionally required, and which I think is under serious stress at the moment too, is some sense of solidarity with strangers a sense that the well-being of others, people you don't know, strangers you'll never meet, that you have some vested interest in their well-being and vice versa. And that's proving extremely hard to keep buoyant as well in a world of growing economic and educational inequality, and also a world of increasing cultural, religious, ethnic, and racial diversity. And that too, I think the big lie has brought to light. So just to conclude for now, to make a dent in the crisis of truth in democracy today, I think we need not just to tackle problems related to the institution of truth. This civil society forum is a good step in the right direction, for instance, but I don't think it will do it alone. And I don't think many of the possibilities that I bring up in my book, Democracy and Truth, will at this point do it alone either. I think we need to tackle the problem of truth in relation to the problem of democratic procedure, voting rights, for instance, and in terms of thinking about how to fortify democratic solidarity, which might mean doing something about our vast inequalities and creating some common cultural foundations as well. And I realize there's a catch 22 in this kind of ambitious approach because it's very hard when democracy is under threat to persuade undemocratic parties that have no incentive to help strengthen democracy to get in on the project. But to build back democracy itself, I think we have to focus not just on broadly desirable policies, but on bolstering the kind of essential groundwork on which democracy rests. And to me, that's the great challenge in front of us. And I'm happy to say more you know, in our discussion and in the question and answer period as well about what that might look like. Thank you. Oh, okay, unmute. Um, thank you, Sophie, that was really interesting. I'm looking forward to uh, unpacking a little bit of that um, in our conversation. <clears throat> uh, so Rebecca Solnit is our second speaker. Um, Rebecca is a writer, historian, and activist, and the author of more than 20 books on feminism, Western and urban history, popular power, social change, and insurrection. Uh, her books include Hope in the Dark, Men Explain Things to Me, A Paradise Built in Hell, and most recently, Orwell's Roses, a product of the California public education system from kindergarten to graduate school. She writes regularly for The Guardian and serves on the board of the climate group Oil Change International. Um, so Rebecca, um, I was hoping you could talk, I mean, about whatever you want to talk about, but, but one of the things I was curious about is, is the ways in which, um, your writing and thinking about feminism and your writing and thinking about Orwell have, have sort of informed the way that you come at this, this problem. Thank you. It's exactly what I plan to do. And, uh, so I prepared a little, so I'm going to read. The term crisis of truth implies many things. One of, one of them is that there was a consensus of truth or a thriving ecology of truth that is now in turmoil. And I believe that is true in some respects and want to challenge it in others. I come at this question from multiple directions as a feminist, a scholar of the thought of anti-fascist writer George Orwell and an American citizen looking at the Republican Party 
morphing into a radical right-wing authoritarian movement, very much like the ones Orwell feared and tried to equip us to face down. Where all these things converge is in the trouble with authoritarians. They want to control facts and truth and data. They see science, history, and any other independent source of truth, fact, and data as a rival power to be conquered or suppressed. This can be as true of the tyrant who's supposed to be the head of the family as the authoritarian head of state. They want to be master of the narrative, the only narrative, the one that crushes all other narratives. They want truth to be whatever power says it is, and they want to hold that power tight and keep it to themselves. Orwell said, a totalitarian state is in effect a theocracy. And in other words, all other truths are regarded as a kind of blasphemy. The full title of this event is The Crisis of Truth in Democratic Societies and in Public Life in the United States. The right is at war with the democratic part of this, as well as the truth part. As a feminist, I feel that crisis is the wrong word for patriarchy, which was a stable system in which women were largely voiceless for millennia. By voiceless, I mean our truths were not admitted into the corridors of power. We did not write the defining narratives or make the laws. We were not judges or professors or priests or historians. We're excluded from participation and little represented or misrepresented in the record. We lacked power in public and in private. Marriage was until very recently a contract giving a man almost unlimited power over a woman. The power of voice to determine what should happen to you, to say no, to set boundaries, failed when we were raped, and too many of us were and are raped, and then we did not or do not have the voice to be believed when we spoke afterward if we did, which of course dissuaded us from speaking at all. When Supreme Court Justice uh, Samuel Alito cited uh, the English jurist Matthew Hale and his leaked abortion verdict um, or opinion, Many noted that Hale defended marital rape by denying it could exist because of husbands' unlimited rights over the bodies and person of wives. And they also noted that he had some women burned as witches. Fewer of them noted that it was his opinion that women who say they're raped should be regarded with skepticism, which helped set up centuries of women's voices not mattering in this situation either. So I want to, touch, I want to reach for another dictionary definition of crisis, which is the turning point of a disease when an important change takes place, indicating either recovery or death. And I th a patriarchy was the disease. Feminism has brought the crisis, the turning point, as an attempt to bring us towards health rather than death um, for the voices of women, for equality, for full participation, because feminism is an endeavor to make women equal before the law and in everyday life. That power includes the capacity to decide what is true and important and who should be heard. Because one way to define patriarchy as a disease is one in which half the population is afflicted with being unheard and unbelieved, silenced or punished for ridiculed for speaking up. Likewise, non-white people were not regarded by this country's white supremacy as worthy of being full and equal participants in society. Slave owners criminalize learning to read and write for this reason. We now have attacks on voting rights that attempt to silence the political voices and choices of those very descendants of the slaves. Homosexual desire and attachment was also silenced throughout most of uh, you know, history, quite literally called the love that dare not speak its name 130 something years ago. The last 60 or 70 years have seen a revolution in whose story will be heard and who decides what's true, what matters, who matters, what love and anguish can speak its name and its truth. So we're in the midst of a liberation that is changing the nature of truth itself by inviting other perspectives and voices in, by changing who decides what matters, a liberation aimed towards a democracy of voices. There's a wonderful opening line by Nicole Hannah-Jones to the 1619 Project that has so upset the right in this country. She said, Our democracy's founding ideals were false when they were written. Black Americans fought to make them true, which I think has profound bearing on both questions of democracy and truth. So we're in a backlash against this inclusiveness in this light, the battles against women and queer and trans people, 
people of color and immigrants, and the battles against teaching and supporting versions of US history that recognize the monstrosity of slavery, genocide against Native Americans, are all part of the same campaign to go back to that version in which only one kind of person has full rights and standing to speak, to determine who and what matters, to be in charge of truth. This is a crisis, trying to push us back to the days when most of us were silent, when our truth was not the truth that would be heard where it mattered, when we were not full participants. It's notable that this backlash has gone full authoritarian. So this is the other crisis of truth, a war against democracy and against truth. As Heather Cox Richardson put it in her letters from an American missive last night, the modern Republican Party is about using the power of government to enforce the beliefs of a radical minority on the majority of Americans. The Republican Party was heading in this direction for a long time before Donald Trump, with campaigns of lies about abortion and voter fraud, with voodoo economics and climate denial. Trump groomed and disinhibited them. Their lies are no longer sleeky di are sneaky distortions, but bold fabrications, as you can see with the lies about the 2020 election that led to the violent attack on democracy itself as fair elections, the will of the people, and Congress is carrying out constitutionally ordained tasks. Trial by combat, shrieked Rudy Giuliani that day, meaning let power as violence prevail over law and fact and the will of the people. They have fully committed to minority rule and the concomitant suppression of the majority of democracy itself. In his 1946 essay, The Prevention of Literature, Orwell wrote that lies are integral to totalitarianism, something that would still continue even if concentration camps and secret police forces had ceased to be necessary. I believe he says this because lies establish an arbitrary economy of information that one party or boss controls, in contrast with the quest for truth pursued by scientists, journalists, and ordinary people sifting the data themselves. It's why he calls such a system a theocracy. It matters whether or not people believe the lies, but unbelievable lies wielded by those with power do their own damage. To be forced to live with the lies of the powerful is to be forced to live with your own lack of power over truth, which in then can mean lack of power over anything at all. Authoritarians see truth and fact in history, as I was saying, as a rival system they must overpower. Orwell writes, from the totalitarian point of view, history is something to be created rather than learned. Totalitarianism demands, in fact, the continuous alteration of the past, and in the long run probably demands a disbelief in the very existence of objective truth. And of course, authoritarians are not quite totalitarians, but they generally or often aspire um, to that condition. For Orwell, words are contracts we make with each other. Falsehood is a disintegration of the integrity of both language itself and those contracts between people we make with what we say, what we write. It breaks the bonds, the trusts, the relationships that knit together a society, a body of knowledge, a, a system of shared belief, a reliable um, body of information. So Orwell attacks both lies and tries to model in his own writing what honesty and integrity might look like. His great muse for this project was Stalin, who was intent not just on liquidating his former colleagues so that he could ru rule unchecked and uncontradicted, but on destroying them and their credibility in ways that terrified everyone into and to silence and obedience. My friend Adam Hochschild wrote about the Stalinist era, execution was the favored solution to every problem, including those caused by previous executions. When the national census in the Soviet Union showed that his reign of terror was shrinking the country's population, Stalin ordered the members of the census board shot. The new officials, not surprisingly, came up with higher figures. Vladimir Putin, with his domestic terrorism intended to prevent Russians from stating the truth about the invasion of Ukraine, is clearly in this lineage. The first victim of war is truth, goes old saying, and a perpetual war against truth undergirds all authoritarianisms, from the domestic to the global. Thank you. Thanks, Rebecca. Um, okay, there's, there's, a, there's a lot to unpack here. Um, I. Um, I wanted to return 
to something Sophie mentioned about um, the way that the, the sort of crisis of truth that we're talking about is a symptom of a kind of broader crisis in sort of societal cohesion. And, you know, I think, you know, there's a couple kind of meanings of the word truth that, you know, you can think of when you talk about there's this sort of, you know, empirically derived truth of science. There's these sort of communal, like we hold these truths kind of truths um, that have obviously been really important uh, to us as a nation. And I'm, I guess I'm curious if, if, the, if, if the sort of failing trust in institutions and this sort of uh, disintegrating trust in each other um, are, are linked things. Yes, that's, I mean, I, I think you're absolutely on to something here. It's, first of all, we don't fight about all kinds of truth in mm -hmm. a democracy. We don't fight about logical truth, for instance. Two plus two equals four is not generally going to be a political concern. And in democracies, in principle, big truths, does God exist, for instance, are supposed to be off the table, hence the separation of church and state, though we can talk about whether that's in effect at the moment, but largely speaking, enormous moral truths are left to people to private, to left to private life in a certain sense. But there has been long been an understanding that certain kinds of basic moral truths, very fundamental ones, and a certain shared set of facts, both about what's happened, historical facts, and about what causes what, which might be called kind of scientific facts, are the groundwork on which democracy needs to sit. That for instance, we can't have a debate about policy questions until we've agreed on what we're talking about. You can't decide what to do about an employment policy if you haven't agreed yet whether employment is up or down. That these are kind of the, the groundwork. And then we disagree because we have different moral principles, we have different philosophical attitudes, we have different um, understandings of what we want to accomplish. But that's, but it's very hard to imagine a democracy without that kind of foundational part. And I think you're right that what's happened at the moment in the loose way in which we're supposed to get to these truths in a democracy, which is this kind of back and forth between experts and ordinary people, voting, constant correction of course, um, the ways in which we've come to certain kinds of truths say a general acceptance that smoking causes cancer or something like that. It hasn't worked in recent years in quite the proper way. And some of that has to do with a refusal to accept expertise and a pushback. We can talk about the structural features that create that kind of pushback on say climate change as a fact. Um, and some has had to do with declining trust in each other. The sense that there, there are no points of general agreement anymore, that even things that should be uncontroversial turn out to be controversial um, precisely because we have so little faith in each other. We don't agree where truth should come from. We don't agree what methods should be used to discern it. And we don't agree who should be the spokespeople for it. Um, and the result is definitely a kind of fracturing of that low level kind of consensus that's needed as a kind of groundwork for democracy. Now, of course, Rebecca is entirely right that this was in the past, perhaps much easier to ascertain in a less diverse society in which fewer people had voice. But the, the pluralism of our world can't be taken as an excuse for getting rid of the possibility of some kind of solidarity underlying that pluralism. And the question is how to do both. I guess I would say that I think a, a, a lot of people, maybe the majority do have a kind of solidarity and diversity. We are an increasingly non-white country and an increasingly progressive country and the right essentially has fully committed itself to minority rule through voter suppression, um, the pursuit of economic inequality, etc. And I think something that should definitely be part of this conversation is ec the rising economic inequality and the rising power of the super rich, and um, whether it's uh, Rupert Murdoch's Fox News, um, and a lot of a lot of the untruths we're dealing with come specifically from not kind of 
populism is the sense in you know regular people are crazy and make some crazy decisions but they're promulgated whether by powerful institutions the gun industry the fossil fuel industry pushing um the cult of guns and climate change denial um you know over the last several decades what Na naomi oreskes calls merchants of doubt sowing information useful to their cause and silicon valley has begat a new sort of set of oligarchs who have a very warped sense of what constitutes freedom of speech as we can see with the garbage coming out of elon musk's uh, mouth as he attempts to take over twitter and uh, a kind of deregulated information economy that has also undermined the financial basis for the news industry particularly the local news industry meaning that people have far less access to traditional reliable sources of information and just to the information overall that makes you a good participant in your local community. And I'm here in San Francisco right now where uh, a billionaire has backed a recall of our democratically elected district attorney because he's super progressive. And it's essentially in California, you can buy your own elections in the form of recalls if you have enough money to gather the signatures. And if you run aggressive enough campaigns, you can spread whatever uh, untruths you like. And so I think both things for me are happening, as I see it, are happening at once, this kind of rising ultra-democracy of um, a kind of Jesse Jackson rainbow coalition of inclusiveness, democracy, egalitarianism as values and practices more than ever before, and a huge backlash as both kind of um, oligarchical wealth, a kind of the new Gilded Age, and as an extreme right wing that is really pre-enlightenment and anti-democracy and its uh, guiding principles. Um, yeah, why don't we talk about Elon Musk and Twitter, Twitter a little bit? Um, I, I uh, you know, it, it's to the extent that this is not just a fifty billion dollar vanity project. Um, the the, the way that Musk describes what he wants Twitter to be is uh, a, a sort of more wide open, less regulated conversation where, you know, nobody is banned for life for anything. Um, and it's sort of, it has echoes at least of this kind of old fashioned like ACLU idea that the solution to bad speech is more speech, that there's this marketplace of ideas where everything sort of goes out there and they duke it out. Um, I, do you guys want to jump in? I, there was, yeah. because, you know, there's a, there's, right. Does that still exist in a world with Facebook and, you know, YouTube and Twitter? I mean, there, there's so many problems with our analogies for free speech. Of course, the abstract principle that protection of dissent is a fundamental right and a cornerstone of our culture it goes without, in a sense, without saying. But the misuse of the idea of free speech in recent years has been a serious problem. We don't really live in a marketplace of ideas in the, as the old metaphors suggest, I don't think, because um, for one, it's way too big. You can't see everything out there. We're not having a debate in a town hall or even three newspapers. We're in this world where there's just an enormous competition for our eyeballs. And so we're much more likely to just look at the things we already know and support. I mean, in a strange way, the more information there is, the more restricted our own information gathering is. But beyond that, the idea that the that our new town square will be Twitter, which will be controlled by one extraordinarily rich, powerful person is an alarming one, simply because the world of free speech was supposed to be the world of the public sphere. And the public sphere is now a company and a company that's respondent mainly to shareholders, but in this case, maybe even an individual. Um, and, and that said, the old, the old notions we have of free speech also don't account for the kinds of censorship that can happen through private ownership or the kind of censorship that can happen through the public sphere. They also don't account for um, lies. They don't account for bullying of different kinds. And so there are many ways in which um, the model of free speech that we've inherited while having some sort of noble centerpiece to it 
has been distorted in ways that make it really unuseful for thinking about the world we're actually living in right now. So that's that's my that's my um, polemic for the day. I completely agree at the same time that I think you can look at it as if you use the marketplace metaphor, you can look at what an utterly deregulated marketplace does. You get sold toxic food, things that don't work, things that are mislabeled. At, uh, you have monop destructive monopolies, which of course we have now because we've stopped prosecuting monopolies as they did when, you know, in the era of Teddy Roosevelt, they broke up Standard Oil. And, um, you know, and of course what Twitter, which Musk wants to take over is infamous for is um, doxing hate speech, death threats and rape threats against outspoken women, trans people, people of color. Um, people who have historically been marginalized, these kind of gangs of men, a la Gamergate, intent on silencing people and Twitter, Facebook, and other social media platforms, which tend to be run by white men who don't understand what it's like to be marginalized, tend to be very bad at even recognizing how how not level the playing field is and how much absolutely unregulated speech deny in this sense denies some people of their speech and uh, you know and we've seen it happen in recent years the tech journalist taylor lorenz who left the new york times for the washington post has been the subject of campaigns by glenn greenwald and tucker carlson um, to attack her massively online and it's had a huge impact and not only on somebody like like her specifically, and she does have major media institutions backing her up, but I suspect young women who might also want to do what she does as a journalist to talk about the things she talks about, or just to speak up at all, are reminded by her example that, you know, there are people ready to try and crush you and punish you for having a voice. And that's part of the landscape that these guys um, don't even comprehend because they're so privileged within it and part of the landscape i think of oligarchy now that wants to be in charge of democracy and equality and at some level doesn't even comprehend what they are how much do you think that the problems we're talking about arise from i mean you know again there there is a history here of a long history of tension between the business models of information purveyors um, and the expectation that they accurately present the world to their audience. You know, you can look long history of newspapers and proto newspapers and the history of television. And, um, but it does feel at least to me that there's something qualitative and quantitatively different about um, where we are now in terms of how people get their information and the, the, the way that people, an enormous and growing number of people get their information from social media um, and these are, you know, whether you're talking about Facebook or Google, these are extraordinarily powerful, wealthy companies that have gathered an enormous amount of information about their audience um, and discovered that, you know, inflammatory content, whether or not it's true, is incredibly engaging. And engagement is the most important thing for companies that sell ads. Um, so um, I guess I'm curious whether, you know, how much this intersection of technology and economic incentives ex explains where we are. Go ahead. I don't think I don't think you can blame big tech and social media for all of it. I think that they've furthered a problem that already existed and um, but they definitely, you know, they definitely have made things worse and not better. And it's always worth noting that um, you know, liberation movements and social justice movements and voices for truth and uh, human rights also use social media and use it very effectively. And we've seen insurgencies from Black Lives Matter to the um, Arab Spring also use, use these platforms. But I, in a way, I think the tragedy is that these things should have been created as non-commercial public commons search engines as well as social media platforms and communications networks and uh, 
And I remember when Google started offering free Gmail accounts and at a time when everybody was used to paying for their email server, we were still in the age of AOL and things and, you know, and then social media being free. And of course, as we say, I'm here from San Francisco, which has been swallowed, you know, eaten alive like a kitten by the alligator of Silicon Valley. Um, you are the product and the, you know that you are what they're selling to the advertisers and it's created to go back to Orwell an information regime far beyond anything Stasi, the KGB and the FBI back in the day ever dreamed of, of knowing everything you looked at, everything you bought, everyone you're in communication with. I remember, you know, a dozen years ago, seeing seeing them pull stuff out of personal emails of mine to target market me you know you look at you say something about tango dancing and suddenly you get in in a personal letter and suddenly you're getting tango um advertisements on social media and just a sense of the utter lack of privacy which is a really important part i think of democracy um is you can't have freedom of thought without the freedom to think and speak uh, on your own terms without supervision, uh, which is why Edward Snowden's revelations were so important in 2013. Um, and they've been, you know, the situation's been rectified a little bit in terms of the government um, invading our and violating our privacy, but tech um, hardly at all. And so, so I think on the one hand that they are not fully responsible for the larger crisis of democracy and of truth, but they've been remarkably uninterested in preventing the circulation of QAnon propaganda, anti-vax propaganda, and the rest, that they have been huge contributors to it. Sophie, do you? Yeah, let me just, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a really good question, Drake, because in some ways, of course, you're right that media going all the way back to the founding of the country has always been super partisan and sensationalizing. I mean, if you look at newspapers from Philadelphia in the 1770s, you know, your eyes will pop out of it, uh, just how nasty people were. And they accused each other of all sorts of crazy things. And people knew which newspapers were aligned with which political factions. So in that sense, the, the unusual part is the development of the idea of objective news later on, which really doesn't happen until the late 19th century. So in some ways you could say, look, we've always had a completely both partisan and commercially interested media. Free speech has meant, and free press has meant a commercial press. And the idea is that in competition, at least you can come to your own conclusions better than a state press because you hear multiple points of view, though everybody's commercially driven in the end. And that really hasn't changed, I don't think. But I do think there are two new features to the landscape Rebecca's describing. And one of them is that news now appears to us 24 seven. It's, 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 we're constantly updating. We look at our phones everywhere we go, or at least I do, um, and hard not to, and it's targeted right at you and it doesn't stop all day long. And so in some sense, it dominates our lives in a way that when a newspaper used to come once a day and you left it and you went off to work and left it on the, t the table, um, didn't have anything like that kind of impact. And the other one is that because so much of our news comes to us through social media, there's no vetting process. The news that comes to us is absolutely unfiltered. Occasionally something is marked as contested, but most of the time it makes no difference. And if you think of the difference between the level of vetting that by any real publication that really takes its standards seriously and what comes across your social media feed, most of us are not careful enough about what we're reading and where it comes from. So we're absorbing, um, you know, cousin somebody's views and those of a serious journalist all at the same time. And those features, I think, have made us have a different relationship to the information we consume. Sometimes that's for the good. As Rebecca points out, there are things like the fact we have our cell phones with us all the time has allowed people to document, say, police brutality that wouldn't have been noticed in an era in which information was controlled differently. But it also means that a lot of information comes to us that's wrong, uh, misleading deliberately or not, um, nasty in various ways, demeaning, 
and it's really hard to get away from it either. So I do think there are, you know, thinking historically, I do think there are certain aspects of our culture today that really do look different and they only look different in the last 20 or so years. Well, um, I think we promised people some solutions in this uh, webinar. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> um, <clears throat> You know, I, we've established that this is a gigantic problem with hundreds of years of history and lots of money and entrenched interests. So, but I mean, uh, how do we start to, you know, the, the topic of regulation has been touched on here. Um, so are there, uh, you know, maybe examples from history of ways that we've managed to kind of uh, knit back together some of the trust or, or things like that, um, you know, either on kind of a societal level or maybe just individual things we can do. I mean, it, speaking historically, I think what you can say is that every previous speech environment had some rules attached to it. That <laughs> you know, um, even a town meeting, there are rules who gets to speak. Now, sometimes those rules kept people out, but they also kept people listening to each other and keeping, and keeping some kind of dialogue going. And to my mind, we do need to reinforce institutions that produce reliable truth, you know, combat, for instance, anti-vaxxers that Rebecca referred to. And we do need to teach people both a kind of properly democratic skepticism about official truth, but also how do you arrive at truths when people say they're doing their own research, what do they really mean? How do you do research properly in different domains? That's a kind of truth side to this. But there's also one simply about establishing rules of speech and rules of communication. And what I think is missing from the web, and one reason I can imagine, even Europe is pointing the way in certain ways with um, a better set of laws, is coming up with some kind of rules about who can say what and what can't be said and what's dangerous to say and holding some people responsible for it. And I don't think that means censorship. I don't think that means getting away from allowing people dissenting ideas. I think it simply means a kind of decorum about speech that's missing and I think would help our political culture. So I, I, that's, I mean, this is sort of of a piece with my emphasis before on truth and rules going together, but also thinking, moving away from a kind of wild west of the marketplace as just anything goes and towards a, a, a more regulated speech world that targets decorum more than content. I would add that my friend George Lakey, a historian or a scholar of nonviolent social change, is a great believer in both polarization and crisis as when you sort things out and make progress, you know, uh, in some ways. And it, I, I feel in some ways something's coming to the head or the situation in the US is coming to the head as a rising majority faces a minority uh, that refuses to give up domination, power, control, including over truth and fact. And I feel like, well, you know, the the Rainbow Coalition I mentioned, the, the, the majority will win in the end, but not necessarily in the short term and for human rights, for the climate crisis, for a lot of things what happens immediately matters, but we will be a non-white majority country in a little over 20 years. And the Republican Party has tooled itself to be the party of white grievance. And the part of why they need voter suppression is because they're losing um, the ability to win elections outside of the really red uh, states and, and regions. And so it feels like the crisis in the sense of things coming to a head is upon us and figuring out how to win, um, you know, in as soon as possible, which for me, you know, I'm not a strategist, but I am as a writer and a historian, a great believer just in the importance of describing something um, accurately as the beginning. I mean, to treat a disease first, you have to diagnose it. And I think the work that uh, Sophia and I do, and you too, and um, um, Drake is, often very diagnostic. Here's the situation. You know, I don't know exactly what we should do about it. I do think that regulation of social media may be for the public good and as a public commons or some of the checks that is Sophie points out, Europe is putting on them are key. 
But we also have a struggle around voting rights and full participation and this attack on reproductive rights that's just exploding in our faces would make women unequal at the most basic level. If you can't control your fertility and your body, then you cannot be an equal participant in professional, public, economic, and really in personal life. And so it's a huge threat to the equality of women on all levels. And, uh, you know, and based, of course, on lies, the anti-abortion movement has proceeded on lies all along about who has abortions, why people have abortions, um, calling a embryo with a tube that will eventually become a heart, a fetus with a heartbeat is a piece of propaganda. And, um, you, you know, there's, there's, and so, you know, I don't have solution. I feel like I have a diagnosis. I don't have a cure or a treatment program, but I feel that defending, for, uh, equal, defending a set of values, defending um, empiricism and kind of enlightenment ideas about truth and science and verification in the record and uh, teaching uh, people to be smart consumers of information to fact check and to know who's trustworthy and um, know that you're not going to do your own research on something like COVID better than most of the scientists in the world or on something like climate. Mm -hmm. So, so I feel like it's all turning together, you know, this kind of new, new versions of an old problem and new solutions and, you know, the, the moving piece the, the moving parts are innumerable and I'll so I'll just stop describing them now. <laughs> um well I I mean Rebecca I I do feel like uh the stuff you've been saying was sort of brought a note of optimism into this conversation that I didn't necessarily have on my own before this. I mean you what you're describing is that there's this there's this sort of that the conversation is larger now and that there's a backlash against that, which is part of what we're seeing, but that, that we shouldn't lose sight of the fact that like, that's a, that's, that's an encouraging thing um, in and of itself. Absolutely. And I think what the very title of this panel brings to brings to us is that the crisis of truth is a crisis of democracy and vice versa. And there is, you know, that the right wants to become a theocracy that dictates really a set of religious beliefs that we all have to uh, obey. They want to determine what history we're allowed to know, what books we're allowed to read, who's allowed to speak. And it's a radically anti-democratic process that's also essentially a radically anti-truth process. But there's a wonderful essay by Michelle Alexander, the author of the book, The New Jim Crow, that was in the New York Times in 2018, my favorite essay, I think that year that said, we are not the resistance, a phrase that was so popular after Trump's election. She said, we are not the uh, resistance, they are, we are the river, they're trying to, they are the dam, we will wash over it, we will knock it down. And so essentially they're a resistance movement to this broadening and inclusion. And if you go back not very far, the United States is a country in which almost no black people have held higher office at almost any level. You know, we have Thurgood Marshall, you know, I think I was probably a child when he became the first non-white um, Supreme Court justice. I was a voting adult by the time Sandra Day O'Connor became the first woman. I almost, I sadly the year of the women 1992 is when a fully four women went to the senate and four women was a lot more than we'd ever had before and uh you know you look at if you if you look at the details on a lot of different levels we've had a huge shift that i think is actually accelerating in a lot of institutions i'm seeing the environmental movement much more convinced much more committed to justice equity inclusion diversity and uh, people much more aware of who's speaking. And we have jokey phrases like um, mantle for all male panels and people noticing things they didn't notice before. And, you know, feminism has had a beautiful lurch forward in the last decade and uh, anti-racism as well, not just to call out racism, but to demand full inclusion and to demand that the stories be told from the perspectives of slaves as well as slave owners, indigenous people as well as 
pioneers in the, the U.S. cavalry. So I see a tremendous shift happening that's also happening at the level of public monuments and statues. Robert E. Lee statues coming down as Harriet Tubman statues go up, changing of street names and the names of university buildings and things like that various kinds of acknowledgments of the sins of slavery on the part of Eastern universities at um, a real rise of Native American power of participation and representation. So, you know, and I could, you know, and then like I could oh, no. go forever, but Rebecca? I'll stop. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I just do think it's important though, to, to emphasize though, that, that it isn't entirely a kind of, black and white situation that the forces of sort of progress are on light on one side and the forces of reaction are on the other. Um, there can be variants of censoriousness on both sides. Um, and that's not to make a kind of false equivalency, but just to sort of think that we, we, we have to resist the idea of sort of demonizing anything that looks like the opposition because then there's no possibility of finding common ground. And I think the one of, to get back to the truth theme, we have to have some low-lying shared shared commitments and otherwise we're an, there's no democracy is an unworkable form we'll need a different form of government and i do think we have to seek those even when it seems like and i think there's hope in that i think there's a, in the idea of not writing off those with whom one disagrees politically but trying to find those spaces in which um a kind of enhanced vision of what we share is possible. But I'll stop right there. I'm actually going to dissent with that call for consensus okay. because I think I have I will not find common ground with Nazis. I there is mm -hmm. no shared values in people who want women to lose all rights of bodily self determination. I think I can. I think it's important to find ways to communicate with them to try and bring mm -hmm. them over you know, their minority views, but well, well, the anti-abortion is very much a minority view, seven, you know, something north of 70% of this country believes in women's reproductive rights at some level. So I feel yeah. like all through the Trump era, there was a call to find common ground with people who hate us, want to harm us, um, who are often promulgating anti-Semitic conspiracy theories, lies, you know, um, demands for women to become separate on it and on equal again, um, open racism. And so I think that we have to be really careful about what common ground is and that it doesn't become tolerance of something that is intolerable, especially yeah. when it's intolerable for somebody else. And again, I, I, I will agree that that I'm not calling for an agreement about large principles at all, yeah. because actually that's not what I'm saying. Um, I think that's precisely what a democracy and a pluralist democracy needs is different opinions. And, we, and we're not gonna reach a point in which everybody is on the same page on almost any topic one can think of. And some of, and of course, the sort of tolerance for Nazism is not at all what I'm yeah, suggesting. Of course. I mean, I'm not, I'm not uh, and, and hopefully Nazism is still a minority strain in our, in our broad culture, a very minority strain. Um, I mean less that, and I mean less where I started, which is on the agreement about certain kind of things that are lower lying than the question of should abortion be legal, for instance, or um, who gets to speak. Questions about procedure or rules, which are really formal ones. Questions about the status of truth, which is, again, not about um, opinion at all. And things like that um, COVID is a disease and could cause you death, um, which should be an apolitical statement if ever there was one. Um, and those are the kinds of solidarities that I'm thinking about. And so I, I, I'm not calling for sort of making common cause with the reprehensible, <laughs> but I am calling for imagining the kind of common humanity in people mm -hmm. And that crosses people that you disagree with vehemently, that you there's a common humanity, that their fate collectively matters to me and my fate matters to them. That's a kind of solidarity that we're all in this together in some way around the world, no matter how different we are, not just in the way we look or where we come from, but how differently we think. Mm 
And I think that if we move away from that, we've really moved into a kind of tribalism from which it's hard to come back. So in some sense we do, it doesn't mean forgiving people for reprehensible ideas, but it yeah. does mean a shared humanity. I had just wanted to put it on the record. I didn't think you thought those things, but I did hear, particularly after Biden's election, a lot of calls for finding common ground that ignored that there are people one does not want to find common ground with or one has no common ground with people who, you know, the people who want to kill me are not people I have common ground with, essentially speaking as, you know, a, child, a woman, a feminist, and etc. So, you know, so I just want want wanted that to be part of the conversation. And welcome back, Drake. We missed mm -hmm. you. I'm here too. I'm Thank you. Some, Sorry, everyone. Technical I've got difficulties. Some questions um, to, to transmit from the audience. Now, was, and what I'm going to do is combine a couple of them together. I, I was sort of taken by Sophia's comment about decorum, um, which is really a, a, a set of rules of good behavior, I guess you'd say. Um, I'm thinking of the, you know, the, the decorum that allegedly uh, obtains in the Senate, where you refer to your enemy as your opponent, as the honorable gentleman from you know, South Carolina or something like that. Rules that I guess are becoming increasingly difficult to maintain. But also I'm struck, um, and, and, and Sophia will appreciate this as a college professor, that, that decorum is, to nobody even knows what the rules are anymore. I remember I, I started teaching a a class in introduction to anthropology and I got a, my first email from a freshman who led off by saying yo Mike and you know <laughs> on, the one, on the one hand I said I don't want to be the pompous professor and say I'm not Mike to you and I'm certainly not yo um you know Mr. Brown will do or Professor Brown or Dr. Brown but you know and it was a it was a well-meaning attempt to be to communicate right so you almost feel like a a pompous fool to say, I'm sorry, that's not how you talk to your professors, at least until we get right. to be a senior, right? Um, but, and so, and, and the other thing, and on, so on the right, the question is, and some of these questions have come in from the audience, which is like, who makes the rules of decorum? Mm -hmm. And then from the far left, you get the sort of the, the fetishizing of transgression, which is to say, breaking the rules of de decorum to break through the silencing that, that Rebecca was talking about. So how do we, so I guess, uh, and this reflects a couple of questions that are coming from the audience, like who sets the rules? Do you just try and, and, and revitalize the existing rules like the Senate, the rules of Senate decorum, or do you just invent? Anyways, let me, and I'll finish one thing. And, and, and there was also an interesting comment that came in on the chat line, which was about this movement. Uh, and I'm sorry, I don't know anything about this, but groups called Listen First, Braver Angels, Civil Talk, which is really mm -hmm. about um, listening. I mean, about civil listening as much as civil speaking, whether you thought that that was a promising um, line of discussion to deal with these issues. Well, you, you've created here, for instance, certain rules of how we're operating yeah. that, and they, and they may seem, you know, unpleasant to some people and deeply desirable to others, but every forum has certain rules attached to it. So this one, for instance, you've told people to ask questions in the chat or the Q and A, we are sort of, res we respect each other's time and, are listening to each other and responding. And that's because there is a kind of formal dynamics at work as well. Mm -hmm. And I don't think there'd be one sort of set of rules that what I do in a college classroom around a seminar table is I hope create a set of rules that allow people to feel free to res speak and res but respectfully hear each other and respectfully respond. Um, you can't really, a seminar table is not the public sphere, which is much more chaotic and less rule driven. But I do imagine that if, we th if we're going to go back to uh, Drake's great question about Musk and Twitter, uh, a free for all is not really going to serve anyone's purposes. There need to be some rule specific ideas about what can't be said, how one responds to people, and when there are violations, people should, there should be consequences, mm -hmm. either for the platform or for the speaker or for both. And, um, you know, and there already are many things we can't say in the public sphere. Anybody who says they're kind of a free speech absolutist, you can't go around advocating terrorism. You can't um, sell faulty equipment. You can't, you know, there are lots of things that you can't say. You can't, you can't talk about, um, you know, sex with children. I mean, there are lots of things that we have already criminalized as speech. So there, so the rules are already there. The question is how to 
create a better set of them, I think. Rebecca, do you have a response to that? I, I do. I do worry when it turns into the call for civility, which is often people. Over, oh, not not you, but the question. Yeah. And you know when it's called when it which civility often is like those people over there should pipe down when they're people with real grievances, who often feel that they have to yell or do something dramatic as with anti-racist protests to get people's attention. I'm not sure what the left-wing extremism you mentioned, Michael, is, but, um, you know, and I think in some ways I see a new ethic emerging of generosity and kindness that wasn't really part of the culture, but of course it doesn't apply on, uh, to every, you know, not everybody up you know believes in it upholds it practices it it doesn't function on so social media very well so i do feel that the sense of crisis that we're in is we're in you know the the old system is crumbling and that new systems are being formed and they might they might be better in a lot of ways but they're not universal and they're still you know very raw and being figured out and in the meantime, we have just the circulation of information problems with the problems with uh, social media, et cetera. I think that people spending less and less time face to face with people and more and more time kind of in the abstract world of online. And there's been a lot of stories in recent years about people who were horrible trolls being unveiled and um, you know, and not only are they incredibly upset for people to know who they really were when they're doing that, but they often kind of say that wasn't really me, that there's some way in which their full self wasn't present, that they didn't feel fully obliged, fully connected, fully accountable. And so I think that's also at, um, you know, we're still figuring out how these systems should work. And I don't think the people in charge of them, the, the tech moguls have done much to help us. And I don't think civility is really the, the question. I mean, to say, to, to be prohibited from yelling something racist at somebody on Twitter yeah. is not saying, well, you know, yeah, that's civility. It's the opposite. I mean, it, what we're talking about is policing a kind of um, hate speech. You mentioned people threatening to rape other people online. I would hate to say like, well, you know, because civility is a kind of tone policing, you should be able to to say, I'd like to rape you. That doesn't seem yeah. right to me. Yeah, no, that's not what I'm saying. What I'm actually saying is the people, um, kind of the establishment telling like young black people who are really outraged about police stuff that like, you know, shouting in protests and blockading is not civility. You know, we're now, hearing complaints about protests in front of senators and uh, Supreme Court justices, um, mm -hmm. you know, homes as basic rights, you know, which is arguably a violation of privacy, but as women across the country are about to lose their a much deeper right to privacy um, that these people support. So, so for me, That's civility, yeah, civility is a problem when it's, the status quo telling new voices to pipe down and play by rules that these new voice that don't that have kept these these voices down all these years. And but we can't. I mean, the rules would have. I mean, in other words, if, if it's okay to protest outside the house of a Supreme Court justice, it's also okay to protest, say, outside the home of somebody who's known to be an abortion provider by the, the way yeah, the law works, no, right? I mean, it's no. a complex one. We can't pick it is. always which side we wanna see um, ex it be able to ex express its civil rights. Either we think protesting in a private house is okay in general or not. Much I'm as we might like one cause or the other. I'm the law doesn't work that way. Sorry? I'm actually opposed to it as a feminist because doxing and et cetera. But one of the things I wanna add is when somebody doxes an abortion provider, gives out their information or shows up at their home, there's a history of assass of murdering abortion providers, mm -hmm. which means they're in a very different position than a lot of other people, um, you know, and being an abortion uh, provider isn't really comparable to being a senator or a Supreme Court justice who's actually taken a highly public office in ways that 
might make it different in the same way that um, the First Amendment applies differently to, I have the right to say things about public figures that I don't about private figures under the First Amendment. Um, an interesting question that came in from Connie, um, and it might be a good one to end on since we are coming around to the, the top of, well, that we've gone past the top of the hour. The question is, do we know what educational techniques work to produce students who can be critical consumers of popular culture? What educational curriculum can develop people capable of creating, or I guess I would say maintaining or enhancing a, a civil society? That's a great question. And I think that's something we'll have to think more about in the years to come, because the really sometimes this isn't something that one learns till college and it should be probably taught from very early on and the critical years are k to 12 years in which two things need to happen one has to learn how to be critical of established truths how to challenge ideas how to be skeptical about received wisdom that's part of growing up and the other part is to learn how to come to and recognize what counts as the best read we have at the moment on situations, which is a form of truth. And that's taught in a variety of different, the, the premise of almost every subject matter should be taught around how do you get to something called knowledge? How do, how do historians come to know what they know? How do um, climate scientists come to know what they know? How do even people in literature come to establish the truth about characters and behavior and sincerity and meaning? And if we reoriented our curriculums in that direction, we might go some way towards educating people long before they get to college about the difference between not just truth and not just truth and falsehood as moral differences, but the, the difference between knowledge and falsehood as epistemological differences. Mm -hmm. I agree. I, I would love to see some of the archaicisms in the public school curriculums thrown out and kids given really great training and how, how to find stuff out, um, whether it's scientific finding stuff out, library research and fact checking and things like that. And I, you know, I, it's always surprising to find how many people don't have really good senses of how to find something out. Or, just, or the habit of finding something out of, of saying like, oh, that's interesting. I wonder if it's true. I'm going to go look it up. And so, I, um, which I think can be really fun and exciting for kids as a kind of detective hunt. Mm -hmm. Who said this? Is it true? What's the context? Is there countervailing information? So critical thinking and research, fact checking, library, kind of librarianly skills, uh, data sorting, uh, certain kinds of logic, really kind of how to think and, you know, and how to find how to learn is implicit in a lot of things people are taught, but it's, you know, but a lot of learning is still rote. And, um, uh, you know, I feel like, like, because the world has changed so much, education needs to change to equip people in ways that you see most people in, in the public are not particularly well equipped now. Well, on, that, on that note, perhaps we should end. I just want to thank Drake Bennett, Rebecca Solnit, Sophia Rosenfeld for a vigorous discussion. We could go on for hours, I'm sure, and the <laughs> questions could go in for hours too. Apologies to audience members who didn't get questions asked and answered, but I'm sure you can see why it's, it's such a complex issue. Thanks again to our participants. And uh, thank you. Yeah. Thank, thank you, Drake. Take care. Bye bye. Bye.